Okay. So you're seeing my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, chapter 14, which is an uh, introduction to uh, time series uh, regression and, and forecasting. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think we have uh, discussed a little bit about time series when we were looking at uh, panel data. Until I was like, I think I was asking the, the, the difference between these things, or it was mentioned there. But uh, basically, a time series data is uh, collected for a single entity over time. Um, like a, a single entity example could be like inflation, unemployment, stuff like this over time. This is fundamentally different from a, a, a cross section data, which uh, is data on multiple entities at the at the same point in time. So. What is not clear to me is, uh, is uh, like a cross section data and a panel data, is there any difference or they are all the same or what? I don't know. Okay. The time series data allows uh, estimation of the effect of Y, effect on Y of a change in x over time basically we want to know the effect of y on a uh, on uh, of a change in x over time like it helps us to do that so and uh, in econometrics econometricians will call this uh, dynamic color effects um, so let us go back to chapter uh, to the application of cigarette consumption of chapter 12 where we were interested in estimating the effect of effect on cigarette demand of a price increase caused by a rise of the general sales tax. One might use time series data to assess the effect, the causal effect of a tax increase on uh, smoking both initially and in subsequent uh, periods. Yeah, the causal effect. Another possible application is in forecasting. Uh, time series data is uh, forecasting, for example, weather services. Also, we might be interested in forecasting um, like uh, is it uh, inflation, also uh, unemployment rates? These are all interesting um, macroeconomic variables that we might want to forecast. So, so it says the remaining chap chapters in the book deal with uh, um, uh, econometric techniques for analyzing time series data, as well as their applications in forecasting and estimating dynamic uh, product effects. Uh, this section covers the basic concepts presented in chapter 14 of the book explains how to visualize time series data and demonstrates how to estimate simple autoregressive models where the regressor are, are past values of the dependent uh, variable or other variables. In this context, we also discuss the concept of stationarity and important properties, uh, which, yeah, concept of stationarity, it's a, like it's a key concept we'll have to look at an important properties which has far reaching consequences. So basically in the chapter, they will be, he will be using uh, more like macroeconomic indicators from the US, US data. And uh, these are the, 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 the packages we will need to install to be able to replicate some of the examples in the plots that are in the, in the, in the, in the chapter. So I, I must say the chapter is a bit long, but that is mainly due to a lot of examples uh, he's given and also a replication of the the r plots from the book so we might not uh, spend a lot of time on those we'll try to look at the like the key concepts yeah and uh, as i go through if you if you have any questions or some comments uh, feel free to come in or if like uh, a particular point is not clear to me i'll um, see if you could uh, also add in some points so it starts with uh, using regression models for forecasting. What is the, what is the difference between estimating models for assessment of causal effects and and forecasting? So like uh, whether like if we run regression models to look for causal effects or for forecasting, you know, like forecasting is basically more like uh, predicting, whilst for uh, the causality we look at like does x cause y, whilst for forecasting we just predict how much how much does x predicts y. So these are uh, uh, now going back to the uh, consider the, again consider the simple example of estimating the causal effect of the student teacher ratio on test scores introduced in chapter four. We could see here that uh, we in in chapter six we had um, discussed that the results we got 
the coefficients on the te uh, student teacher ratio does not have a causal interpretation due to omitted variable bias. However, in terms of deciding which school to send a child to, it might nevertheless be appealing uh, for a parent to use the mod like this model or this uh, simple uh, OLS regression for forecasting test scores in uh, in school districts where no public data on on scores is available. So this uh, figure we get this uh, it's more like a predictive uh, figure. Um, um, it gives us the uh, on average, the, the test course where the average class size is uh, 25 for districts where there is no public available data on, on scores. However, this uh, in, in a time series context, the parent could use data on present and past years uh, test scores to focus next year's test score, a typical application of a autoaggressive model. So now he's like trying to motivate the whole idea. Now he's showing us examples of time series uh, data and how they look like and the concept of serial correlation, autocorrelation, autocovariance and, and things like that. Uh, common time series data includes uh, GDP. So uh, it's trying to replicate one of the, 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 the figures that have been in the book. So it is, uh, it is useful to work with time series objects that keep track of the frequency of the data and uh, uh, extensible um, example of we could uh, time, time series class are usually XTS like which shows that the, the data class is a, is a time series and we could use this R codes to um, um, convert this US macro data to a time series format using this uh, XTS uh, function and we could also get the growth rates of the series by using the log and the lag to adjust it for group groups. Yeah, and that's it. Uh, this is the US quarterly real GDP. You could see uh, it's a, a sort of has a, like a sort of an upward trend. It has sort of a, so we usually take the logs and the lags just to help us normalize the data uh, and, and things like that. Using uh, the US real GDP rates, um, now we could see the growth rates. We could see how the GDP has been uh, growing over time. This doesn't look uh, uh, stationary to me, um, but anyways, we could test that and the chapter will show us how to test uh, for stationarity. Uh, yeah, so now he's trying to show us some mutations, lags, first differences, lags, first differences, uh, mutations, and, and things like that. So the, the previous value of a time series are called lags. So the first lag of yt is yt minus one. The j lag of yt is uh, yt minus j. In R, we could use the lag, the lag function to lag a particular variable. Sometimes we work with uh, uh, with uh, with uh, difference series. The first difference of a series is uh, delta yt, which is like uh, my, uh, subtracting the previous value from the the, the current value that gives us the the, the difference of the a particular series. But if we do this, we usually lose like the uh, one 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 data point. Normally, when we do take uh, the lag of a particular variable, we usually lose the first data point. If y is a time series, if y is a time series, the the, the series of first differences are computed using the diff y. And, and and also if the 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 the, the series like y t has a unit root, if we differences, the first difference is usually stationary. Uh, it may be convenient to work with the first difference in logarithms of a series. We denote this by the first difference uh, log of y t, which is like log of y t minus uh, log of y t minus lag lot of lacked like the first lag for a time series y this is obtained using this uh, log um y over the lag of y and like a hundred uh, times delta uh, like hundred times the first difference of log of yt is an approximation for the percentage change uh, between y and, and yt most like like sort of is it the elasticity or stuff like this 
Yeah, and, and these definitions are very important because uh, it helps us to um, normalize uh, if because of two properties that are common in many economic time series. Exponential growth, uh, uh, some economic time series grow exponentially, uh, grow approximately exponentially such that their logarithm is approximately linear. Uh, it's easier to work with uh, um, linear like data than if the data is non-linear, which might require us to use other techniques. The standard deviation of many economic time series is approximately proportional to their level. Therefore, the standard deviation of the logarithm of such series is uh, um, approximately uh, constant. Yeah, so it's just trying to justify why we need to do some transformation of our time series data to avoid some problems like um, to avoid problems of non-linearity and also some other problems that might arise when we use uh, um, the time series data without doing some transformation like to use logs or to use uh, like cost differences. Now we look at the concept of uh, autocorrelation, which is like the, the, the like the, the series are uh, correlating over time, you know, that's like sort of a, a relationship between the series over over time. Like the like in a time series, the yt depending on yt minus one and yt minus one depending on yt minus two, uh, things like this. Observations of a time series are typically correlated. This type of uh, correlation is called autocorrelation or serial correlation. Yeah, or serial correlation. No, uh, this uh, summarizes this autocorrelation and uh, autocovariance. Um, the covariance between yt and its jade lag, yt minus j, is called the jade autocovariance of the series yt. The jade autocorrelation coefficient, also called the serial uh, correlation coefficient, measures the correlation between yt and um, yt minus j. Thus, we have um, so the covariance, the jet uh, covariance is the covariance between um, yt and yt minus j. Whilst the the the, the autocorrelation, it's uh, basically the covariance between yt and yt minus j. Sort of the covariance between yt and yt with the j lag all, all over the 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 the, the square root of the variance of yt times the variance of yt with the j lag. Uh, but we can easily do this in R using the uh, a ACF uh, function, which is from the start package, which uh, computes the sample autocovariance or the sample autocorrelation function. So uh, basically, um, uh, these are things that uh, we always have to check uh, when we are working with a uh, time series. So we could see that using the uh, ACF uh, function, we could see the correlation. Uh, this is evidence that uh, there is a sort of a mild positive correlation um, in the growth of GDP. So we used uh, the, the fourth lag, we, the maximum lag was like four, this example. So these are other examples of uh, um, key macroeconomic uh, uh, variables like US, uh, US uh, unemployment rate, the US uh, dollar to British uh, pound exchange rate, the logarithm of the Japanese industrial production index, as well as uh, daily changes in the well share 2005, uh, well share 5,000 stock price. So now we looked at some R codes to uh, the next uh, code chunks to produce plots of three macroeconomic series and add percent changes in the daily values of the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index as a fourth one. So these are the R codes to generate uh, these uh, um, plots. This this has just been adopted from the book. So uh, in a sense, he's just given us how to generate the R codes to replicate those uh, plots that have been in the main which this uh, uh, book relies on. So we could see the series, we could see the 
unemployment rate um, doesn't seem to be um, it it it, it uh, increases. Uh, we, we could see it increases and also decreases. Which uh, if we zoom in, we could see that maybe it is during recessions it uh, declines and when the economy booms, it it goes up. We could see the U.S. Uh, dollar, uh, U.S. dollar to British pound exchange rate. We could see it's taking a downward, like a sort of a downward trend, something like this. Um, the, uh, uh, and Japan's industrial uh, production exhibits an upward trend. You could see that. And uh, like the the New York Stock Exchange composite, it's the a daily exchange in the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index seems to fluctuate randomly around the mean, around zero. Like, uh, so it seems to be sort of stationary. It seems to be stationary. Out of all these plots, this one, this is the one that seems to be like uh, somehow stationary. So we could see also that to the sample, uh, the, the sample autocorrelation between this uh, conjecture, we could uh, the first ten, uh, we could see the the the, the autocorrelation for the te first ten. The first ten sample uh, autocorrelation coefficients are very close to zero. The default plot generated by the ACF provide further evidence, um, and we could see. Of course, we have some exceptions, but it's only in few cases where it's a. Uh, uh, the blue dash line, the blue dash band represents values beyond which the autocorrelations are significantly different from the 5% level. So we look at uh, the other key concept, which is the autoregressions. Uh, autoregression, autoregressive models are heavily used in, uh, in, uh, in economic forecasting. Also in, in, in macroeconomics, most of the analysis will use the autoregressive model because you know they, they, they work a lot with time series data. An autoregressive model relates a time series variable to each pass. Um, so this could be a, this is a good example. You could see yt um, is a autoregressive process of order one. So which is like uh, AR1. Where one indicates the order of the regressive process. Yeah, that is, it has lack of one. So yt is modeled as uh, beta naught, that's a constant plus uh, beta one, um, yt minus one. So it is modeled based on its just, it is its last year value and the error term. is an AR1 population model of a time series yt. So we could uh, model GDP like that. For example, we could say the GDP growth rate is equal to beta naught plus the previous year's GDP growth rate. So following the book, we use data from 1962 to 2012 to estimate uh, equation 14. Easily is easily done by using the AR OLS uh, function from the start package, which uh, uh, gives us uh, uh, these nice results. However, we could also use uh, um, simple OLS by the we could just use the LM function to 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 do this. But uh, that could be a bit uh, tedious, but the results will nonetheless still be the same. So we could uh, obtain like summary statistics. You could see the, 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 the estimated coefficient for uh, GDP growth rate with uh, the lag of one, it's uh, 0 0.33. So we, we, we omit the first observation for the GDP growth rate uh, 1962, the Q1 from the vector of dependent variables since, uh, yeah, since this is like uh, in, uh, in growth rates, normally things like this, we usually uh, lost, we usually lose one uh, data point. So put differently, when estimating the model, we observe a one observation is lost because of the time series structure of the, of the data. Yeah, I think uh, this one is just trying to do some um, um, forecasting and uh, explaining the, uh, the forecast error that is usually involved in, in forecasting, which uh, makes it not very, very reliable. We usually have some forecasting errors. And it also, 
yeah, compares it to the mean squared focus errors. Yeah, I think, uh, to, yeah, we could look at the key concept, 14.3. Uh, for, for forecasting GDP growth, the AR1 model in, uh, um, in 14.2 disregards any information in the past of the series that is more distant than one period. An AR of order P model incorporates the information of P lags of the series. The idea is explained in, so, so we see an AR of order P, like an AR of order one is not very realistic because we are saying that the, the, the YT depends solely on its previous value, which is not uh, usually the case. Same, like saying that GDP depends on last, this year's GDP, uh, it's uh, explained by last, only last year's GDP, doesn't make much sense, but an AR of order P says that the P, the, 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 the series sort of, an AR of order P model assumes that a time series YT can be modeled by a linear function of the first P, of its lags, where we have yt is equals to this, where the lags um, go up to p. So, so sorry, I think p could be um, any value from one to to n, right? Or it has some upper limit. Yeah. Yeah, it could be any value from one to, to n, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, and the zero condition mean has to be satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's like this uh, uh, assumption is still following us. It has to be like the, uh, the there, should, there should be no correlation between the error terms and the, 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 the lagged values of, 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 of y from one to p, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So following the book, uh, they estimate the AR2 model for the GDP growth series. And it was uh, a 0 0.28. Uh, we see that the coefficient on the second lag is significantly different from zero. The fit improves slightly, R square. So the fit from the, the using the first lag and the second lag, sort of the fit improves uh, a bit from uh, 0 0.1 for AR1 to model to 0 0.14 and the, the, the standard errors reduce. So in a sense, we are saying that uh, using a AR2 model seems to be more reliable because it has better fits compared to just a, a simple AR1 because in a sense, the AR2 has more information since it's uh, um, estimated based on the first uh, lag and the second lag. So this is an example to illustrate the concepts we have seen so far. The, 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 the theory of uh, the, can you beat uh, the market, uh, part one, the theory of uh, efficient uh, capital market states that uh, stock prices embody all current available information. So if this, uh, this theory is true, then it means that um, um, investors cannot easily uh, sort of beat the, the market yeah, they cannot easily beat the market since uh, the price, the market price reflects all the the available information for this particular stock. So they cannot uh, beat the, the market by uh, um, doing some arbitrage or things like that. If this hypothesis holds, it should not be possible to estimate a useful model for forecasting future stock returns using publicly available information in past returns. This is also referred to as the weak form Efficient, efficient hypothesis. Uh, if it was possible to forecast the market, traders would be able to arbitrage example by relying on an AR2 model that would use information that is not readily, read, uh, that is not already priced in, which would uh, push prices until the expected return is zero. So he's trying to show whether this uh, idea is really true where we could just use, we start by 
uh, importing monthly data from um, 1931, the first quarter to 2000, and to the, uh, like the second quarter on excess returns of a broad base index of stock prices. So these are just some uh, data adjustments they did. And now they like estimate, uh, next we estimate uh, AR1, AR2 and AR4 models of excess returns for the period uh, 1960, first quarter to uh, 2002. And we could see uh, this, we could see the results from the table. Yeah, we could see that um, from these results, it seems to be that the uh, efficient market, uh, the market efficient market hypothesis holds because um, using uh, AR1, AR2, none of the, the, the coefficients are significant, even at the, at the 5%. The results are consistent with the hypothesis of efficient financial markets. There are no statistically significant coefficients in any of the estimated models. And the hypothesis that all coefficients are zero cannot be, cannot be rejected in a sense. Um, uh, in a sense, the, the, uh, the, 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 the stock prices reflect all the available information and uh, uh, traders cannot really do arbitrage by using AR2 or AR3 mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. So we could add additional uh, predictors to the um, AR model, which will be the uh, AD, ADL, the auto regressive distributive lag model. Since uh, an AR, basically a simple AR model just relies on the, the lagged value of the dependent uh, variable. So we could extend it a little bit by adding other predictors that are not necessarily based on the lack, that are not necessarily the lack of the dependent variable. So an AR and ADL, like auto-regressive auto, auto distributed lack model of order PQ, order PQ, where P is the, the order for the auto-regressive part, while Q is the order for the other predictors. Model assumes, that a time series yt can be represented by a linear function of p of its lags and q, yeah, so q and q lags of another time series, which, which in a sense make more sense and it tries to make the model more rich by providing it with more information. So we could see the, the q part, which has the, the lag q and, and has coefficients with, uh, that are represented by the delta and the, the beta, the y, the, the y, the lagged y values are the autoregressive component, whilst uh, the x's are the component that captures other predictors that helps us to explain y. In an autoregressive distributive lag model with p lags of yt and q lags of x, where still the zero condition mean holds, where the expected value of the the error term given the yt lags and the xt lags is equals to zero. Yeah, like if you have any points to add up to this point, yeah, you could always uh, come in. So it, it, it gives an example of uh, forecasting uh, GDP growth using the, the term structure. And you could see how it uh, it uh, it looks. Yeah, the uh, the the interest rates and the the the, the, the three months and the 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 ten years uh, treasury bills. You could see how they overlap sort of. So in a sense, we could say, can we use the, the three months treasury bills to predict how the 10 year one will, will behave? I'm not sure that that, 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 that might, might be very useful. But in a sense, you could see there are some, uh, some, some kind of a, um, a 
predictive power in a sense. And this is how the time structure looks like. So you could see during the periods of recession how it's uh, it, it 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 affects it. During the 2007-2008 financial crisis, you see it was almost at its uh, lowest. You could see also just before the um, during the 1970-78 and. 79 we could see yeah that's like the mean yeah that's that's the mean so it's uh it's not uh, the, the series is not stationary because it's in a sense it is uh, dependent on, on time yeah I think now it talks. You should talk about stationarity. I think so. Yeah, it's given a lot of examples. But now we we move to uh, uh, stationarity. Um, in general, forecasts can be improved by using multiple predictors, just as in uh, cross-sectional regression. When constructing time series model, one should. Uh, take into account whether the variables are stationary or non-stationary. So stationary, a time series, yt is stationary if its probability distribution is time like independent. It's time, so like the probability distribution doesn't depend on time. That is the joint uh, distribution of y st plus one, st plus two up to st plus t does not change as s is varied. Uh, regardless of t. Similarly, two series uh, xt and yt are jointly stationary if the joint distribution of the series does not depend on s regardless of t. In a probabilistic, probabilistic sense, uh, a stationary stationarity means that information about how a time series evolves in the future is inherent. It's like sort of inherent to its past. If it is not the case, we cannot use the past of a series as a reliable guideline for its future. So, so serialty makes it easier to learn more about the characteristics of past data. Yeah, I don't know if you have, have any comments on this. Mm -hmm. But uh, but basically, the way I'm getting it is like uh, the series uh, uh, should not be sort of uh, dependent uh, the, on the sort of the, the mean and the variance would be time invariant in a sense. That could be a very simplistic way of saying it. Yeah, more. Yeah, this is a, yeah, just kind of a testing about this, the kind of a time dependent or time, time independent kind of test. So it is kind of like a, when the past data actually affects to the value of the future. So yeah, it's a, kind of like, uh, testing about the is the kind of a time series involved kind of analysis or not so yeah hmm. so time series regression with multiple predictors i think this is just um expanding the um ADL model that we have seen previously by adding extra predict, uh, predictors to the to the model. So sort of to make it more complicated, but in a sense also more informative. Uh, in this case, uh, the we'll still need to make sure that the zero conditional mean uh, assumption, the error term uh, ha yeah, has to be satisfied in this case as well. The IID assumption data is, the IID assumption for cross-sectional data is not entirely meaningful for this time series data. We replace it by the following assumptions that uh, the yt the the additional predictors have a stationary distribution so they are stationary that is they are, they, are, they are time independent and the uh, and b the the, the the yt and the additional predictors and the lacked value of the yt and the lacked values of the 
additional predictors become independent as J gets larger. That is the identity, the independently distributed part of the ID assumption. Mm. And uh, sort of the, the large outliers are unlikely. And also no perfect uh, poly polymerity. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, this assumption also uh, is called the weak uh, dependence, which ensures that the the law of large numbers and the central limit solving pulls in uh, large samples, sort of, yeah. So uh, since uh, so many macroeconomic time series appear to be non-stationary, assumptions uh, uh, 14.6 is a crucial one in applied macroeconomic and finance, which is why statistical tests for stationarity or non-stationarity have been developed. Yeah. So I think next we'll look at some uh, statistical tests for uh, non-stationarity. So the uh, the Granger causality test uh, the is an F test of the null hypothesis that all lags of a variable X included in a time series regression model do not um, have predictive power for YT. The Granger causality test does not test whether X actually causes Y, but whether the included lags are informative in terms. Of, yeah, so it's basically test of stationarity, right? Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Like I said, the chapter is too long, so we'll just have to focus on the key concepts. So now it looks at the, the lag length structure using the uh, information criteria, the, the selection of lag lens in, so like the selection of how, how many lags we should consider in AR and ADL models can sometimes be guided by economic theory. However, there are statistical methods that can be used to determine how many lags should be included in our regression. So uh, in general, too many lags inflate the standard error of coefficient estimates and thus imply an increase in the forecast error while omitting lags. That should be included in the model may result in uh, um, estimation bias. The order of an AR model can be determined using two approaches, using the F-test approach or relying on the information criteria. In that case would be the either the Bayesian information criteria, the uh, the, the big or the Ike or the uh, Akai-K information criteria. These are um, the, the two main um, approaches, either the F-test approach or the information criteria approach to help us determine the, the, the number of lags that we might want to use to estimate either the AR model or the ADL uh, model. And, and sort of it gives uh, examples on how to do these things. I think uh, we could uh, just uh, skip that. Yeah, so now it, uh, here now it's, sort of giving an example of a, 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 a two main examples of a non-stationary um, situation where there is a, a trend. And, and, and the, the last example it shows in the case where there are like sort of breaks, like breaks. Uh, like a, a series is non-stationary conventional, if a st series is non-stationary, conventional hypothesis test confident intervals and and forecast can be strongly misleading. So if the series we are working with is non-stationary, it means that the hypothesis, the test, the results that we might get from our hypothesis test, or even the confident intervals might be might not be reliable. They might not be accurate. There could be some biases in them. So the assumptions of stationarity is violated if a series exhibit trends or breaks, and the the, the resulting complications in an econometric analysis depend on the specific type of non-stationarity. So now it's, it's looking at the two, two specific types of, uh, um, like uh, this section focuses on time series that exhibit trends. Uh, a series is set to exhibit uh, a trend if it has a persistent long-term. 
So uh, yeah, a trend is a deterministic. A trend is deterministic if it is a, a, a non-randomness of time. Whilst it is stochastic, when it is dependent on time. So I, I think we'll be looking at a stochastic uh, um, trend sort of, which uh, which in that case will will violate uh, the stationarity assumption. And and sort of we will not look at the deterministic case. So uh, it gives an example of a random walk model of a trend. Uh, the simplest uh, model of time series YT that has to cast this trend is a random walk we are in YT depends on the previous value of YT plus the error term where uh, the error term is uh, identical IID with uh, the zero conditional mean satisfied. Wherein the expected value of yt given the, the lags of yt is equals to the first lag of yt. So, so basically it's saying that the best forecast for yt is yesterday's observation, that is yt minus one. So, so the reason why it's called a random walk because the, the part followed by yt consists of a random steps UT, hence it is called a, a random walk. And uh, this is an example. You could see that YT is basically um, the summation of all the error terms from where from one to one to T. So we, we, we can see that the variance sort of is the variance is time dependent, which is which will violate the assumptions of stationarity because basically the assumptions of stationarity is saying that both the mean and the variance to be time independent or time invariant. So time invariant. But here we can see that the variance of a random walk is time dependent. Thus, the variance of a random walk depends on time, which violates the assumptions is, uh, described, uh, presented in key concept 14.5. So therefore, a random walk is non stationary. Oh, I'm sorry for that. So we can see uh, a random walk is uh, um, is non-stationary. Yeah, we could uh, we could test for stationarity. Um, we could test for stationarity if a special case of uh, AR one model where where beta one is equals to one. One can show that the time series that follows an AR1 model is stationary if the absolute value of beta one is less than one. Uh, in a general ARP model, stationarity is linked to the roots of the polynomials. Yeah, like you, you highlighted, if all roots are greater than one in absolute value, the series is stationary. If at least one root equals one, the, then we say that the ARP has a, a unit root. But uh, I think it mentioned somewhere that if uh, an, AR one, uh, an AR of order one has a unit root, no, no, sorry. If he says like, if an, like, uh, sort of if YT has a unit root, then taking the first difference would uh, make it stationary. So we can use the, the Arima simulation to, um, do this in R, simulate and plot random uh, walks starting at zero. We could do that. Yeah, and we could see this uh, uh, this random walk. We could, see, we could clearly see that it is uh, the, 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 its variability depends on, on time. So like, uh, So what are some of the problems that could uh, lead to uh, by uh, uh, problems caused by the stochastic trends? It could lead to a down, downward bias of the AR coefficients we will get, the autoregressive coefficients we will get, non-normality uh, distribution of these t-stats, and it could also lead to spurious uh, regressions. Like, uh, like in this case, uh, we could think that there is some correlation or some predictive power 
or between these two series, but in general, this is just some spurious um, regression, which uh, doesn't have any economic meaning in a sense. Mm, yeah. Yeah, we could uh, test whether there is a uh, unit unit root by using the uh, the Dickey Fuller the Dickey and Fuller test for unit roots. So we are will see uh, like uh, H O uh, beta one is equals to one versus the like the alternative where beta one is less than one. So if uh, beta one is less than one, we will say the series. Uh, uh, is uh, stationary. That is the case when you reject H O. But if if we don't re reject uh, H one, then it means beta one is equal to one, which is the case of a unit root, which which implies that the the, the series is non stationary. I think that should be the key concept. Yeah. So the basically the, the key concept here is just explaining how we can test for unit root, and if we have a presence of unit root, it automatically implies that. The, the the series is not stationary. In such a case, our results um could be there could be some biases in our results. So we'll have to deal with that. Uh, I think there are some um, econometric techniques to deal with non-stationarity in a time series uh, uh data setting. Yeah, I think uh, unless you have some um other points to add but i think uh, this was example it seems to be okay I, because the other example also talks about testing for something similar how to test for unit root and, and things like that yeah hello yeah so yeah nothing had actually close yeah, it is about the depending on the our data is uh, stationary or non-stationary. Maybe uh, I mean that the unit root is a kind of like a function of the whether our our time series data set has a cycle or not. If we can say in a plain English, so like uh, like uh, when we when we draw the graphs, mm -hmm. okay. And then, or oh, maybe I will say like this, T, and I. And then, maybe if there is kind of a linear trend, this like this, these are the keep decreasing or maybe increasing kind of trend. This is actually like a, some of the some of the linear function, right? So in that case, there is a no cycle. It is a still kind of a still trend gonna be exist. But there is also some cases about the Y and T, like uh, there is uh, some cycle like this. That means this uh, can be a cycle depending on the time length. That's the kind of what is called a unit root because we have a cycle. Yeah. There's a uh, two different kind of patterns. So. These all of the these things just in the this section is a uh, testing of the these things. So do we have the cycle, or it is a, a a a kind of a kind of a little trend like this, or maybe our our data is kind of like a cycle like this. Okay, in that cycle there is uh, some of the repeated kind of a pattern like a like a up and down pattern kind of thing so it it repeats it repeats actually over time but there is also kind of a clear trend too so that's the how we can kind of a testing these things yeah thanks yeah Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. If you don't have anything to add, I think uh, that's it from my side.
You think you turn? I'm sorry. You turn? I think you still some some chapter section is left. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So here we have yeah. the the uh the the, the non stationarity or oh, like the breaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the non stationarity too, where we have the case where we have like uh, uh breaks. The the, the 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 first case we looked at was when we have tense. Now we look at breaks, where when there are discrete or distinct dates or a gradual over time changes in the population, um, regression coefficient, the series is is, is non stationary. Uh, it's like uh, like these changes are called breaks. So uh, this uh, breaks uh, in macroeconomic data occur for various reasons, but most often they are related to changes in economic policy or major changes in the structure of the of the economy, which uh, will lead to these breaks. So if we have these breaks and we just uh, estimate a simple OLS model, there will be, there could be biases in our in our in our results. You know, the the coefficients the OLS coefficients will get, or let's say even if we estimate a uh, uh, ADL of order one, one and one, our results might not be reliable. There could be some biases. Hmm. So in a sense, it's like uh, motivating, like if we have breaks in the in the data or how can we test whether there are data, uh, like there is a break in our data. Let uh, Tau denote uh, a known break data. Break and uh, um, yeah, the, so we can use the chart test to to test for 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 breaks. So the null hypothesis will be of no break. That is, uh, there is no break. While the alternative is uh, a break. Yeah, we could use the the QLR test for coefficient stability. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure this. Uh, maybe if you could make some comments on this part, I'm not sure of this part. Yeah, this one is a uh, quite like a very complicated one because it's a kind of a our data set is the non stationary, but the thing is that there is a what what is the break means is kind of like a, it is highly highly uncertainty gonna be involved when we estimate the the some uh, forecast within the, our time trend because there is actually hard to find about the depending on the before and after the those certain period there is a some kind of a clear clear changes or clear trends changes going to be existed. So it is very hard to tell about the just kind of a, there is a no kind of a constant kind of a trend existed. So that's the how it breaks kind of about as far as I read, because I also have a little bit confused and hard to understand <laughs> what this one is about. So yeah, yeah, just kind of keep moving and then I just scroll down to the our example. I think. Yeah, there is a there is an example on the market uh, hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, these graphs. Yes. Yeah, these are the kind of thing to say about the something, some of the app statistic, and then uh, there's a, some of the kind of a implication in it. But yeah, still, I also a little bit hard to understand this one because the time series analysis is a very hard to understand. Yeah. Especially in this chapter, in the later later section of the, this chapter, actually, some are very briefly summarized about the, what these are about. So, yeah, it is still because there is a lot of meaning between the sentences. So. Yeah, it could be that yeah. uh, you can see here it's the the series is uh, only at around the nineteen seventy nine where we have a break. It's, it's significant mm -hmm. at the one something like this. No, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's it for this chapter. Uh.
Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, because as I can say, this is a very, very hard, hard concept, especially the, for personally, for me, I can understand about the lack of and the things, but non tenure concept is like a very hard to understand. I think that maybe in the later chapter, maybe it's chapter 16 and 15, maybe we can, I hope that we can actually revisit this kind of a concept maybe later on. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's say about... Um, okay, hold on.